Hello, everybody out there on the internet. Welcome again to another Spotlight Edition of Give It A Shot. Today I am revisiting something that I watched in a very early episode of Give It A Shot uh, from a couple years ago. Uh, this is the Chipmunk, Alvin and the Chipmunks go to the movies, which this was essentially their swan song uh, for Saturday morning television. They had been running for a while, and this is when they hit the bottom of the barrel. We, last time I watched this was when I watched the title of the DVD, which was Star Wreck, which was apropos, because it wasn't very good. And just to reiterate, in case you are not aware, Alvin and the Chipmunks have been around since the 1950s. It was a cute little gimmick, uh, and it was a musical, it was an audio technique in which you could give uh, people who, who were singing the ability to sound way higher than what they actually sounded like. Uh, and this was before pitch shifting was a thing. Uh, and the technique was used uh, to great effect for its time. The creator of the Chipmunks, um, I don't think his name is on here, uh, Bagadat, uh, yeah, Bagadasarian. Bagdasarian, that's his name. He is the creator of Alvin and the Chipmunks, and he he's the one who made them what they were. They got their notoriety by covering uh, other popular songs in that voice, and it helped them become popular in the 50s and early 1960s. Uh, they had a resurgence in the 1980s and they were given their own Saturday morning cartoon show. Uh, I've talked about this before as well. I had some of their toys. I believe they started the, the cartoon show again in like 1983, something like that. And they were vastly popular. Now, this is 1990. They have clearly run out of ideas what to do with Alvin and the Chipmunks. So, they go to movie parodies. And today, I am reviewing the second episode on here, Chip Tracy. Which, in and of itself, is a very interesting premise. Uh, Dick Tracy uh, was, a, was a comic strip from the 1940s, and possibly earlier. And it also had a resurgence in the 1980s. Uh, for whatever reason, Disney made a movie in 1989. I can't remember the name of the actor. Put it right there, Sam. Yeah, he he uh, he was the lead actor for that, and it also had Madonna, uh, and it was a whole thing for a summer. And I think most of the re I think the big reason why every kid liked that movie it was because it's the only time they could say dick without getting slapped by their parents. Uh, so that's why everyone probably liked it, because it wasn't the fact that they could, um, like the movie was any good, it was just the fact that little kids could say dick without getting, you know, punished for it. So naturally, when you are creatively bankrupt and you decide, you know what, the last season of this show is going to be, uh, cheap parody movies why not let's parody dick tracy we'll call it chip tracy and go with that so how does the story go well alvin shocker shock of shocks is chip tracy and he is on the case to capture the big crime boss the glove uh, and he must do that by um, capturing and interrogating the Glove's goons, which include uh, Grumbles, some guy in a bag, and Flatfoot, who has um, basically what amounts to a ten head. Not even a four head, it's a ten head, because... 
Your mama might want to check something out when you're born and you look like that. Just saying, bro. Uh, but it's it's a story that you know he is going to f capture the glove at any cost, uh, and so throughout the whole thing, he does manage to capture each of the goons, interrogate him, gets one step closer and one step closer. Uh, however, he has a he has a problem. Uh, the other police officers aren't nearly as uh, moral as he is, and they take bribes, which they do talk about in this, which, okay, that was different. Uh, and so there's a little bit of struggle f f to, to get the, uh, to finally nab the glove, and it all culminates uh, with a boat, uh, chase, which is weird to say, and uh, eventually the glove is captured. That's the very basic premise. It's bare bones, it's very basic, but you know, when it's your last season, I know, I guess people just said fuck it and just work with that because. <sighs> There's so much, I don't want to say wrong with the story. It's a very basic story. They had a couple of interesting gimmicks that were kind of cute, but not great. Like, for instance, Theodore in this one is a newsboy. And so all plot points he would bring out as a news headline, which was a thing that was popular back then. But then it would also sort of foretell certain things like... There's an instance where Alvin and, and I don't remember her real name, not that she has a real name, one of the Chipettes, they are tied to a drawbridge, they don't know how to get out, and then he yells, Chip yells at Theodore, well how do we get out? And he pulls out a newspaper and says, kiddo saves the day, which is his name in this thing, and then how does he do it? I don't know, pulls out another paper, he pulls the lever. I mean, it's stuff like that. There's some real goofy elements to this entire thing, but again, this is a gangster film that you need to uh, sort of chill out for the kids. Uh, like, the three goons are seen in a back alley playing illegal games of marbles, which is like, <laughs> that's cute, because no kids in the 80s played marbles. Ever. Uh, and the whole thing that, you know, uh, the other goons were running uh, illegal root beer, which, again, that was a, uh, uh, my mind is drawing a blank. Prohibition. Thank you. Thank you, Brain, because you've been trying to wipe this stuff clean, but it was Prohibition, so... They were, um, they ran that, that bit, which was fine. Um, so I guess that was the, the glove's main thing for running, uh, illegal root beer. And it's, it's, it's serviceable for Saturday morning at the time, but you could definitely tell they were running out of ideas. And so it doesn't have the same oomph as, uh, as it could have. Like, I get it. You know, you've got a whole season where you have to come up with 26 episodes of something. And if you're working with original material, I mean, there's only so many different angles you could go with. But now you're doing that with movie parodies and show, you know, television media properties that's going to be tough. And so how do you work these things together, try to make it child-friendly for Saturday morning? Yeah, I get it. It's going to be rough. Um, so, let's get into the meat and potatoes of all of this. First of all, this is how I can tell that they're having that they're at the end of the line. There are so many animation shortcuts happening 
in this cartoon, it's not funny. Holy cow, the amount of shortcuts between freeze frames and just not animating certain things for, for lack of caring at this point. And finally, the ice melting scene. Because of course you're gonna use a lot of puns in this from that era to just whatever. They're gonna put a girl on ice and we're gonna put you in the deep freeze and all this stuff. And they're in a ice factory of some sort. But when they melted the ice and you have this giant flare that circles in the middle of the screen, that's when you hit the bottom of the barrel. In terms of, you know, mainstream Saturday morning cartoons, you do that, you've descended down to dingo levels of laziness. So here's to the solar flare. Oh, mm. oh, ha! Huh. So that is my chief complaint with that. The animation, and you know what? Just for the fun of it, just put put up some of my favorites right here. You fools! You let Tracy escape! Chip! <gasps> Chip Tracy! That's right, Crow Whip. So that's what we're working with. Uh, there's some other very questionable things going on uh, with this piece. Besides the bad puns and, you know, it, the lack of creativity. There's the other Chipette. I can't remember her name. She's the Alvin equivalent. Uh, she is supposed to be the Madonna character. Uh, they call her M Baloney because I think I think Madonna's character was named Maloney. I think I don't remember these things, and my editing self will correct me because I'm dumb. Because as I'm watching this stuff, I also want to just start drinking bleach half the time. So, eh, you know, I'm not going to get everything accurate. Go figure. So, she is a club singer. All right, that kind of makes sense. And she's, she has a scene where she's singing in the club, and they make her out like, Malo uh, Han I think her name was Hans Maloney, whatever Madonna's character was. But it felt more like Jessica Rabbit because she's strutting around this room singing, which she's a chip at, that's what they do. And guys are passing out from looking at her as though she's this very uh, sexually charged thing, which is the weirdest part of this entire episode. Why are we sexualizing a female, a, a child female chipmunk. I don't know. The 80s were a weird time. I mean, if you ever look it up on YouTube, there there are several video commentaries on Chip Alvin and the Chipmunks the movie and just how sexualized everything is, especially a very particular scene with I think her name's Brittany, the lead the lead chipette and a snake. Just put the image up. It's not very subtle. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know why they felt the need to do that. And it, it still happens. Um, in this, which is years later, after the movie. Uh, because, yeah, I think the cartoon, Saturday morning cartoon show ran seven years, and this was very obvious. Uh, the budgets are getting cut, no one really cares, just pump out the least creative stuff that we can do through parody, and there you go. So, it's, it, it's not good, it doesn't make sense 
moral and ethical issues that I see with this when you sexualize a chipmunk. At the end of the day, it's relatively harmless. It's not good at any stretch. They do have, they do tackle some themes I was, again, not expecting, like police bribery uh, by, in its own weird way, but it's not, it's not terrible, aside from the animation. That is, that's sad. I mean, it's, it's, it's just kind of, it's just kind of sad to see that this once very popular series has just kind of limped along, dealt with seasonal rot, and here we are at this point, which, you know, you might as well just say we're, we, we're done. And this is what you get. I feel kind of bad for fans because it's just... It, it just doesn't seem like that should have been the way it should have ended. Uh, and, and, oh, the other thing that I keep forgetting, Alvin and the Chipmunks, every episode there was always a song, and there's a song in this, and it's... not good. <laughs> Now, I understand, you know, musical rights were different back then, and they do sing a song, which I believe it's Wild One. I don't remember who sings uh, that song, but they, they sing it in here. And it feels a little out of place for Dick Tracy if it would have been something a little bit more jazzier instead of, like, I'm a real wild one. It might have worked. Uh, so... It, it, it just, I don't know, it, it just feels like it's all just cobbled together. It's not anything, it just, it's lazy. That, that's, that's probably the best thing that I could explain to this. This, this whole thing is just lazy and just creatively bankrupt. Um, but I didn't mention this, but in the end, Chip Tracy captures the glove, uh, while he's trying to escape with a huge boatload of illegal root beer. Which is a sentence I just said. Uh, and he defeats the, the, the cronies again. One of them, uh, I think it was Flatfoot, he, he made him fall, uh, trip over some bottles for the second time. Two times Flatfoot is, is, is taken out by basically falling on his butt. Uh, the first time was with the illegal marbles game, and then the second one. Second one is here on the boat, and the second one I severely believe. I honestly believe that uh, Flatfoot has lead in his ass because he went straight through the side of the boat uh, and fell into the water. Most boats have uh, barriers made of metal, and if you somehow bust that. You definitely have a lead ass. So, that's what I believe happened there. But, Chip captures the glove, and shock and awe, it's baloney. Which, who'd have thunk it? Like, as soon as, as soon as baloney is brought in and I saw the legs, I already knew. Like, they didn't even try to hide that. It's just, that's who it was. And... For whatever reason, just because it's the female femme fatale character, even though there was like no real even insti like even ins instigating or uh, allusion to that possibly Chip Chip Tracy and the glove somehow might have had a, a, a chemistry of some sort. It's like, you didn't even insinuate this, but you, you're just throwing it here at the end like it's going to matter. Tell me, Tracy, was there ever a chance for us? Only a fat one. <sighs> and then once the case is solved, uh, Brittany's character, not Brittany, Je Jeanette, that's her name, Jeanette, Jeanette, uh, which is Tracy's girlfriend in this 
says, aren't you going to ask me a question? And then, yes, they're going to get married. And then, boom. But there is one really honest thing about this that I appreciated. And that was, at the very end of the film... Uh, film, as if this is actually a real thing. Uh, one of the last things you see in the cartoon is the end. Unless this makes millions. Which is... It's tongue-in-cheek, it's kind of funny, but it's also like, yeah, it's tragically true. And then there's this whole meta thing about how they're they're making these movies, and something about Alvin making long-distance calls to all these people for reasons that escape me. I don't know what the purpose of these things, these calls are. Um, it makes no sense as to why he needs to make these phone calls and then Dave comes up and and in classic Dave Seville fashion he has to yell at Alvin for something which is apparently the long distance phone bill which was a thing that people had before cell phones huh. so overall it's inoffensive it's not terrible it's just meh like the only thing I can really take a shot over is the fact that the animation is just bad. Now, it's not like there's glaring omissions like in the Super Mario Brothers Super Show where uh, the Indiana Jones hack it has no face the entire time, but it, it's not good. And like I said, it's just sort of a shame to see it because, you know, that here was this once proud... Uh, bastion of Saturday morning cartoons in the 1980s now hits 1990 and is just petering out like a weak fart. So, it's not the worst thing in the world. And I feel bad for it. But it only gets one shot. More out of pity than anything. You know, screw it. I'm going to take another shot to mourn the bloated dead carcass of this once proud um, and somewhat creative franchise. Even before Jason Lee got involved. And then David Cross sold his soul to it. Now that I'm thinking about David Cross, I think I need to take a double shot. Bottoms up. One for Jason Lee, one for David Cross. You used to be a decent skateboarder. You were a good in mall rats. You were a funny comedian that just needed a paycheck. I mourn you both. One shot for the cartoon and two shots for human beings that used to be respectable. But they got more money than I'll ever see and that's okay. Well, until next time kids. Toodles.